Let us now read God's word in John 8. John 8. Verses in the middle of this great chapter that contains debate and discussion between the Lord Jesus and the unbelieving Jews. John 8 verse 21. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. And as he speak these words, Many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, 
he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. And which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Amen. Beloved, this communion season, we have been in John chapter 8. Verse 31 reads, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. We looked at that last Lord's Day evening in our preparatory service for this Lord's Supper. The next verse, verse 32, which completes this statement of Jesus, is our text this morning at the Lord's Supper. And it's all part of the same sentence with Jesus' words in verse 31. If ye continue in my word, then ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let's consider this word of God under the theme, words taken from the end of the verse, the truth shall make you free. First, the misunderstanding of freedom, what the Jews wrongly thought Jesus was talking about. Second, the meaning of freedom, explaining positively what he was saying. And third, the means of freedom, how it is God grants this liberty to his people. The truth shall set you free. The misunderstanding of freedom, the meaning of freedom, and the means of freedom. When Jesus said, verse 32, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, how did the Jews, the church of that day, respond? Verse 33, they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free with indignation? Jesus refers to liberty, freedom, words which essentially mean the same thing. And they understood him to be referring to political freedom, civil freedom. Because you can be free from all sorts of things, depending on the context, and you can be free to do all sorts of things. They think he's talking about political freedom. And they say, we were never in bondage to any man. Because freedom and bondage or slavery are opposites. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And this claim of theirs, we were never in bondage to any man, isn't even true. It is a downright lie. It is so palpable a lie that you almost boggle that the Jews here were so stupid and blind even to say it. Who ruled over the Jews at that time? The Romans. The Romans had conquered them and they were a part of the Roman Empire. And before that, they had been a tiny tributary of three other mighty empires, the Greeks, the Medo-Persians, and the Babylonians. And earlier, Israel had been ruled for different periods of time by other peoples, the peoples of Syria, Philistia, Ammon, Moab, Amalek, the children of the east, and others. And even Israel as a nation began its life as a nation as slaves. Slaves in Egypt working 
on Pharaoh's impressive building projects. And yet they say, we be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And even when the nation wasn't subjugated by its enemies, individual Jews were slaves. Joel chapter 3 mentions slaves being taken from the Jews and carted as far off as Greece. Nehemiah 5 verse 8 has Nehemiah remonstrating with some of the Jews who enslaved their neighbors, fellow Jews, and said, look, We've been spending our money to redeem from slavery Jews taken captive by the pagan nations. And even Jacob's greatest son, Joseph, was sold into slavery in the book of Genesis. Sold into slavery by his ten older brothers. We be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to anybody. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? A bold, brazen, barefaced lie. And if you refer the bondage, because you can be in bondage in different ways and different spheres, if you refer the bondage of the text to imprisonment, so you're not just a, an oppressed people in a pagan empire, but if you refer it to imprisonment, well, even Judge Samson was put in prison by the Philistines. And just to mention a couple of them, King Manasseh and King Jehoiakim spent years behind bars. And what is going on with this statement of verse 33? We be Abraham's seed. And we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? It is blindness. Blindness regarding Israel's present. Jesus could have said, as he said later in the gospel accounts, show me one of the coins in your pockets. Whose image and superscription is on that coin? Caesar's. Yeah. You're a member of the Roman Empire. And you see that military symbol over there? That's a Roman eagle. Look, over there is the centurion. There's the barracks. Yeah, we were never in bondage to any man. What do you think Simon Zelotes and the Zealots were all about if it wasn't for raising up a rebellion to gain national independence or liberty? And when you say we were never in bondage to any man, you are blind about your past. Your own history. And I recited some of it earlier. You are blind as to scripture. God's own word. And you claim to be very knowledgeable of the word of God. Have you never sung the last few verses of Psalm 106. Which we sang. All about Israel and captivity. And praying that God would bring some of his people back from bondage. I mean what's wrong with you people? And this is the blindness, stupendous as it is, it's even hard to understand that somebody could be so blind. This is the blindness of pride. And there isn't anything that keeps people from what's obvious, but everybody else can see as our own pride. And pride especially keeps unregenerate man from seeing his own wretched and shameful condition. This is the position we're in now. Shameful. We're under the Romans. So much of our history involves shame. And I just don't want to look at it. I don't want to think about it. I ignore it. And pride produces spiritual cataracts and glaucoma and myopia. And any other disease or weakness of the human eye that you might be able to think of. And you say to yourself, wow, what were those Jews doing? Isn't that terrible? There's these people back there and that's what they did. It's a good job. We're so much better today. Yeah. 
Well, here, when Jesus refers to freedom, and if you say to people, you know, Jesus in the gospel promises freedom. Freedom is a very positive thing, and you can pour whatever content into it you like. People think, oh, good, I want to be free. What do people want Jesus to give them freedom from? Because John 8 says more about freedom from than freedom to. So we're not going to get so much into that in this sermon. Well, you say freedom to various people and they're going to make the exact same mistake, even in a religious context, that the Jews made. And they're going to think, number one, political freedom. Freedom from enemy states or the threat of invasion. Freedom is deliverance from bad civil governments. Others would say, freedom, I like the sound of that. I want economic freedom. I want liberation from my debts. And the majority of people are in debts because of spending too much money and gambling and all sorts of things. So you can understand why they want freedom from debts. And whatever debts we have, sometimes it's lawful to take them and even wise to take on that debt, like with a mortgage. You can understand, yeah, well, that'd be good to be free from that debt. One last thing in my mind. Freedom from all the bills that pile up. That's the freedom that would be number one in the minds of many people. Who wouldn't want freedom from their various health problems? Boy, if I could sign up for that, and if Jesus would give me that, I'd like that. Jesus, he will fix all your health problems. With the resurrected body and the new heavens and new earth, but you have to wait for it. I like freedom from annoying neighbors. Not the biggest problem in the world, but the way they play their music. I'd like to get a better night's sleep. It gives me headaches. I've got a dead-end job, and my teacher said to me that I should work harder on my books <laughs> and that I wouldn't get a good job, and I never listened. And if Jesus could only free me from that, and you could have other people would actually want to be free from their spouse. You say, no, surely not. Well, that's what divorce is all about. I want to be free from my spouse. Many other people would like to be free from their children. If they could farm them out and get rid of them and not lose too much face, that would be brilliant. They're getting me down. It's too much work. And therefore, since this is what goes on in people's hearts, the way sin manifests itself, the fallen... And the departing churches tailor their gospel, and it's very deliberate, and for many it's particularly conscious, to deal with people's felt needs. Let's do a survey. What do people really want? And just like a political party might do this, and do do this, we'll do this in the church. And therefore we have what's called the liberation theology, especially popular in Latin America. Therefore, we have the health and wealth gospel. Because the health and wealth gospel says if you believe it and follow their superstar pastors, you will be miraculously healed of all your diseases and you'll be wealthy. And let's face it, you deserve it. You deserve it. That's how they tell people. So we change the gospel to tell people what's in their own hearts. And people say, I like that gospel. That's a better Jesus than the Jesus I read about in the Bible. And then you have the social gospel which has slain its millions in the Western world, you'd be a nice person. Just be a nice person. And you'll get to heaven. And we're going to make society a better place. Yeah, by all means, make society a better place and so on. But that's not the gospel. And as with the first century Jews in John chapter 8, people today not only willfully misunderstand Jesus' word because they interpret it through the lens of their own fallen natures and evil inclinations, they not only willfully misunderstand what Jesus said about freedom, they also get annoyed about it. Follow this argument closely. Number one, Jesus speaks about being made free. That presupposes a problem. He's telling us we'll be made free. That presupposes that in some sense we're not free. 
And the opposite of freedom is bondage. And a person who's in bondage is a slave. Mommy, did you hear what he said? That Jesus came and he said that we're slaves. What a terrible message. How dare he? How dare anyone imply that I am not free? That I am actually a slave? And this word of Jesus destroys a particular darling doctrine of not only liberalism but most of evangelicalism that is the doctrine of man's free will man's free will because man's free will is the opposite of what jesus is teaching in our text that man this is what free will means theologically that man has a little bit of good in him and though he's fallen he can choose jesus christ and be saved if he wants and whenever he wants so god helps him by grace but in the final analysis man decides whether he's in heaven or not because he has free will and if you talk to somebody who who has this in their theology this is the number one element in their theology. This is the thing from, to which everything returns. You never get beyond it until that idol is destroyed. Ah, but man's free will. Ah, but what about man's free will? What about man's free will? You talk about justice, but man must have free will. You talk about the nature of man, he has free will. You talk about sin, ah, but he has free will. And you always come back to it. And now, notice here, the opposites these words there's man's free will that's the heresy and then there's the orthodox doctrine of the bondage of the will one's about man's will being free so that i can choose jesus it doesn't require god's almighty grace giving me a new heart it lies in my choice and the bondage of the will man's either free or he's a slave Man has the liberty to turn to God in Christ. Or he is a slave and he cannot do it. He's trapped with handcuffs and footcuffs, if there is such a thing. He's bound in trust and he's impossible for him to do it. He cannot. One says man can. The other one says no, he cannot. Unless God gives him a new heart. Unless grace works omnipotently and changes him. And this is man's blindness. He's blind to his present blindness. Because he doesn't see it, he's a slave. He thinks, no, I can believe. Okay. Any unregenerate person come to them and say, you, you have the power to believe in Jesus. Now, do it. Believe in Jesus. Go on, do it. We want them to believe. We pray for that. But that person will discover that they actually can't. Repent. Turn from all your sins. Die to yourself and believe in Jesus Christ alone as the only Savior. It's as much an impossibility as flying to the moon by raising your arms up and down. You actually cannot do it. It's a psychological impossibility. Man is blind to his past blindness. Did you believe when you were 5 or 10 or 15 or 25? Did you believe when you heard the gospel then? Did you believe whenever you were brought to your knees or some terrible event and you thought, boy, maybe there's a God out there and he's doing things to my life? No, you still didn't believe. And maybe you thought you believed or you said, Lord, I'm sorry. And the next day you were wallowing in your own sins again. You didn't believe back then because you weren't free. You don't believe now because you're not free. A blindness to the human history. Read history. Wow, it's fascinating. Very, very interesting. But you will see that man is totally depraved. It's just one sin after another sin. And this society, current day, sins in different ways. And that other society has got its own sins and proclivities. And then you go back in history through each century, you say, man is the same through it all. He's a sinner. 
and it is blindness to Scripture's teaching. Here is the word of the Apostle Peter, who was there that day in John chapter 8. John, 2 Peter 2 verse 19, while they promised them liberty, while they promised them liberty, in other words, liberty, freedom, they themselves are the servants, literally slaves, of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage or slavery. I repeat, while they promise them liberty, you're free, you're free. They themselves are the servants or slaves of corruption. Here's the argument. If someone overcomes you, then that person has brought you into slavery. And that's the condition of man through the fall. And we'll say more about that later. And this blindness in human nature is arises from pride. Verse 33, the Jews said indignantly to Jesus, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. We are Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And what in theological language in the 21st century is that? How dare you say I'm a slave to sin? We're still in the image of God in some sense. There's a little bit of divine goodness in us. We've still got that ability to choose Christ. We still have this free will, though we do need some help. And then you're saying that the will is enslaved. Yes. And this is the heart of the Reformation gospel. The bondage of the will. People say you can't do anything with that doctor. That doctor is going to put people off. No, that doctor could start the Reformation. And it did 500 years ago. In his reply to the Jews, Jesus makes clear that he is speaking about liberty or freedom from the bondage of sin. Follow the passage carefully. Here's Christ's statement, verse 32. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Here's their misunderstanding, verse 33, the Jews. We are Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Christ's explanation, verse 34. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is the pure truth. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant or slave of sin. If you've been overcome by sin, therefore you are the slaves of sin. Just like 2 Peter 2, verse 19. Have you sinned? Yes, you're a slave of sin. There you are. You don't have free will. Freedom from sin. You will know the truth. And the truth will make you free from sin. Now at this stage, let's say we had a thousand people in the local area tuning in. This is the stage where many people would turn off. I thought I was going to get a freedom that I wanted. And then the ministers talked about freedom from sin. I have no interest in that message whatsoever. But what does it mean, freedom from sin? Well, staying with John 8, it involves the freedom from the condemnation of sin. And the condemnation of sin is that you are guilty before God. And this guilt most definitely brings punishment. Eternal, awful punishment. John 8, verse 10. Jesus said to this woman taken in adultery, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Because they've all left realizing that they committed adultery too. These religious leaders. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. And Jesus didn't condemn her because she was one of his sheep. She was forgiven. The righteousness of God was made over to her. Jesus didn't condemn her. He couldn't condemn her. Freedom from sin means freedom from its condemnation. Not its presence in the believer because it's still with us but it's condemnation. And the passage itself, coming closer to our text, especially refers to freedom from the dominion, government, rule of sin. Verse 34, Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is the truth, let it sink in, 
whosoever committeth sin is the servant or slave of sin. There are two lords. There's the Lord God and there is Lord Sin. And Lord Sin, he speaks authoritatively. And for most people, his commands are the only thing that they ever really obey. And Lord Sin says to all of his citizens, you must always and only sin. And you know what? Every last one of his citizens always and only sin. And it's just a choice of one sin or another sin. A lesser sin or a greater sin. But the only choice is, this is man's free will, which sin will you commit? How deeply will you go into it? Lord Sin says to all of his citizens, you cannot do good in God's eyes. You cannot perform a single good work. Because a good work is done out of faith. And you don't have work. You don't have faith. It's done according to God's law. And you couldn't care less about God's law. And it's done to God's glory. And all you're interested in is yourself. So you cannot do good. And every one of his citizens are trapped in that. And they don't do good. Because there's none that doeth good. No, not one. Apart from irresistible grace and regeneration. Lord Sin says to all of his citizens... You cannot believe in Jesus. Cannot. Verse 45. Because, Jesus said to these people, because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Jesus in effect saying, I could have told you anything under the sun. And you know what? Many of you would have believed me. I thought that. If I in Balamina area proclaim that a, a UFO had landed in the field behind our house, we would have more people more people believing that message, any cock and bull story you can invent, than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, because I tell you the truth, you believe not. That's why you don't believe. I told you the truth. Because you cannot believe the truth. You're slaves. You can't. You cannot, Lord Sin says to all his citizens, you cannot truly and spiritually understand the word of Jesus Christ. Verse 43, Jesus asked them, why do you not understand my speech? Think about it. why, why, why don't you understand? Answer, Jesus gives it, even because you cannot hear my word. You can't do it. Utter spiritual impossibility. You cannot. Good Lord Sin says, I have you. I have you by the hands behind your back. and hand. I have you by the throat. And I will not let you go. And the only thing that can release somebody from that. Is the irresistible grace of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ. Lord sin. Lord sin. And he shows his lordship. Over the ungodly and unregenerate. By what has to be a. It's described as a master move. He actually makes his citizens believe that they are free. And they say, well, I am free to do whatever I want. And, you know, money permitting and health permitting, you are free to do a fair bit of what you want. And then he says, well, you know, you're free to believe in Jesus anytime you want. And theologically, this converts over to, I have free will. No, you don't. It's just another lie. You're deceived. You're in bondage to sin, and you're going around shaking your, your chains and saying, isn't it wonderful to be free? I have free will. No, you don't. No, you don't. Second, when Jesus explains the meaning of freedom, freedom from sin and its bondage, Jesus explains in this passage that he is speaking about freedom from slavery to Satan. To Satan. Jesus here tells these Jews that the devil is their father. And he introduces it fairly slowly. And he says some things. And the people must be saying, oh, he's talking about father here now. What is he getting at? Verse 38, I speak that which I have seen with my father, God, and ye do that which ye have seen of your father. And they're going, who does he think our father 
is. And then verse 39, they say, Abraham's our promise. Verse 41, ye do the deeds of your father. And then they say, well, we weren't born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And so Jesus explains, verse 42, if God were your father, you would love me. Because I proceeded forth and came from God. And if Abraham were your father, you would do the works of Abraham, but you don't do the works of Abraham because you're trying to kill me. God's not your father. Verse 44, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in it. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And now the devil is an evil father, highly abusive. He's a tyrannical lord. And the devil, he says to all of his citizens, similar to sin, you will not and you cannot Trust in Christ. And he says that authoritatively. And not one of his children ever disobey. Apart from those whom Jesus effectually calls out of darkness. You must always, says Father Satan, you must always and only sin. And he gets 100% obedience. If only we as parents had that with our own children. If only the elders had that with everyone in our church. If only we had that as new, as new believers. Whoa. But the devil, he always gets his children to obey him. They're trapped. Verse 41. Ye do the deeds of your father. Ye do them. Verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do and here the word will is in the future you shall do the deeds of the devil will means you want to do it you enjoy doing it you love doing it your heart's desire is just one sin of another and here again we end up with the strange anomaly of willing slaves people love themselves naturally they love their sin and they do not want to stop it that's why they don't go to hear the gospel. That's why they don't seek God. That's why they don't pray. That's why they watch television on the Lord's Day and most of the trash that's on there. And they do anything under the sun to keep them from following the Lord. Yes. Freedom, Jesus is explaining in John 8, is from sin and Satan and slavery to them. And third, He's dealing with freedom from death. Now at this stage, some people would say, well, I like that message, freedom from death. I don't want to die. I'd like to live forever. Although more and more people in the Western world actually do want to die. I think it'd be, we, should, we should legalize it and make it a virtue and be a really good old person by putting themselves to death legally assisted. And our civil government now wants to push this conversation just as they want to promote transgenderism and ban the church from converting homosexuals and transgenders, making it criminal activity. Verse 51. I seek mine own... Verse 51, rather. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And then the Jews are troubled by that saying, and they repeat it in verse 52. Thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. And then they say, but Abraham, Abraham died. What are you saying? Believe in you and you're never going to die. What is this? And they hadn't been listening to Jesus when he said earlier in verse 21, I go my way, referring to his death on the cross and return to the Father. I go my way and ye shall seek me carnally and shall die in your sins, whither I go, ye cannot come. Verse 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die 
in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. And dying in your sins means your death takes you to hell. Because as Jesus puts it in verse 35, the servant or slave abides not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. And if you're a slave and a slave of sin, you're not going into the father's house. You're going to that other place, hell, the eternal punishment of the ungodly. And sin leads to death and Satan's children die, die in their sins and die and receive the second death which is the lake of fire. So clearly, when Jesus explains in John 8 what freedom means, it's freedom from sin, it's freedom from Satan, it's freedom from death as a punishment from God, he's saying that man's worst bondage and greatest deliberation is not political, though we have some sympathy and political liberty is good. If you can get it, by all means, get it lawfully. It's not Financial, man's greatest problem, though work hard, don't throw your money around you, waste it, and certainly don't gamble. And it's not even temporal. Those aren't man's greatest freedoms, although many people wrongly think that they are. They misdiagnose their problem. Jesus is teaching that man's worst bondage, and therefore his greatest deliberation, liberation, is spiritual and eternal. This is what John 8 is teaching. This is what Jesus is getting across to the people here in Jerusalem. Finally, what about the means of freedom? How does it come about? Verse 36, Jesus said, If the Son therefore make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Truly free. A politician doesn't actually make you free. It may give you certain civil liberties, which are not to be scoffed at. A monarch doesn't make you free. And history is full of people wanting to be free from monarchs. A Christian minister can't liberate you. Faith in the gospel, though, by the power of God, does. Jesus says, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The eternal Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, the second person of the Trinity, who became the incarnate Son of God 2,000 years ago. And the Son makes people free by his death on the cross. And this deals with our bondage. First of all, it's bondage to sin. But God imputes the sins of his elect people to Jesus. Jesus is guilty for them on our behalf. He bears the punishment and liberates us from the bondage of sin so that we can't be condemned because God condemned him and Jesus died to give us freedom from the dominion and reign of sin. Jesus liberates from Satan, as Hebrews 2 and Colossians 2 and other passages teach, because Satan's power lies in sin. Break the power of sin and Satan's dominion over you is gone. And of course death. Because he died for us under the wrath of God that our death is not under the divine judgment. Death has lost its sting because the sting of, of death is sin. And our death isn't a punishment from God. Our death, the death of God's people, is a passageway into eternal life, though it still feels pretty awful, no doubt, if it's a long drawn out thing. And medically, you're the same as the guy dying in the bed next to you, but it's lost its sting. And Jesus makes us free on the basis of his cross and by infusing into us the divine life at regeneration. John 5 verse 21, the Son quickens, regenerates, gives life to whom he wills or wishes, desires or wants. And the giving of life to us is the giving of liberty to us. Freedom from the slavery to sin 
and Satan and death. And this is freedom to, freedom to believe the gospel of Jesus, something you never had before. And Christians converted to leader life can remember, I was in a church meeting. I heard the gospel. I screwed up my face. I just couldn't believe in Jesus. And then one time, I could. Because God renewed my will. Freedom to understand the word of God. And little children, in their sleepier moments of catechism, think that's not such a big deal. Oh, it actually is. Jesus talks about that's part of your salvation. Freedom to love God and the neighbor. Because you're a slave and you never do it otherwise. Freedom to do good works out of gratitude. To live as a human being ought to live, though very far from perfectly. And here's Jesus. He makes us free, John 8 says, and he makes us free by use of the truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So Jesus makes you free, and the truth makes you free. But it's not as if there are two opposing or contradictory things that make us free. Jesus is the one who liberates us through the truth. And Jesus himself is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. And when the Bible says here, Jesus speaking, the truth will make you free. It's not a truth, one or two special little things. It's the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth in God's word. All of it. That's what makes you free. The truth about God and life and the meaning of all things and the purpose of the universe and heaven and all the most important things in the world which the world wants to keep from you and have you ever looking downwards and around you to man and never up from your knees and in the word, the truth. And the Bible here says, you will know the truth. Not in some sliding scale of probability. So if you think that this sports team is probably going to win. And I reckon that I will be able to get that job done by the end of the week. You will know it. And you will know it by the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit. The greatest servitude possible for a human being in this life. You will know it by the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit who works in us through the external testimony of Scripture. So if the Holy Spirit seals in your heart what God has inspired in his word. This knowledge, you shall know the truth, is the knowledge of faith. Sure and certain. Because faith is a certain knowledge, a sure and certain knowledge, and an assured confidence that God's revelation and scripture on Jesus Christ is true and that its salvation is for me personally as Lord's Day 7 explains very well. And this text ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free means also that the more you know and the more you believe and the more you love the truth the more free you become and the more free you feel. If you continue in my word, remain in it, abide in it, over time, longer and longer, get deeper into it, then you're my disciples indeed and you will know the truth more and more and the truth will make you free. You read it. You pray over it. You think about it. And whenever that truth of God's word disagrees with anything your next door neighbor or the world or something you hear at school says, you go each and every time unhesitatingly with the word. And you say, that other party is wrong. And that's actually the way of freedom. And embracing the other one is the way of confusion and bondage. Bondage. <coughs> I'm all worried about what so-and-so thinks. Oh, dear. Free from sin's dominion, keep on reckoning yourself dead to it, Romans 6. Free from Satan's lordship, 
resist him and he will flee from you. Though that resisting is a hard battle. Free from the terrors of death as you abide in the truth and you say to yourself, Jesus has defeated death by his death on the cross. He will send his angels to carry me into Abraham's bosom. Like Luke 16 says, I believe this. And as I believe this, the truth makes me free. And free from the tyranny of the world. The fear of man, the disapproval, the snare, which ruins Christians, which brings down churches, which leads to compromise. And that's what's happening in liberal churches. Too many members trapped by the fear of man. The preaching gets dumbed down. Disciplines never acted upon. And the whole thing goes down the plug hole. You want a church consisting of free men and women who worship God and serve him alone. You're free to pray, to call God your Father. Some of the more positive aspects of Christian liberty. You're free with a heart that gives thanks to the Lord. That's freedom, real freedom, not the other counterfeits. And I have to add this for completeness sake. This freedom doesn't mean there's no struggle. The old man is still with us, but he's not dominant. Romans 7 describes the battle within us, fierce and only ending with death. And this truth of God's word in Jesus is sealed to us in the Lord's Supper. Take, eat. Do this in remembrance of him. That death on the cross liberates me from sin and Satan and death to serve the Lord. Eating and drinking the bread and wine symbolizes and seals to us the truth that we're united to this Jesus who conquers and conquers for us and gives us spiritual strength. If you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, enlarge our hearts, deepen our faith to lay hold upon these things and give us liberty to stand for the truth, and to resist lies, to purge them out of our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.